Um, so Stephen Pemberton, um, who is the fifth person ever to be on the internet, because Amsterdam was um, the Europe's leader in internet um, connection, um, and is also, we're very proud, um, is one of the academic grandsons of, um, the, of, of Turin himself. So Alan Turin is here in spirit, the creative practice of, um, of the geniuses of, of, of algorithmic thinking. And um, Stephen's work is very interdisciplinary from pure maths and different ways of thinking about mathematical systems, and numbers, the very concept of the number and of the algorithm. And uh, his title, which I had absolutely no understanding what it meant, but he'll be able to explain it, is the idea of a, a restful, unified access to the internet of things. And I thought that restful meant that it would be kind of an easy thing. And apparently rest is an acronym for something very complicated and difficult. Um, but um, Stephen is also particularly interested in a new computer language. So having worked on, been one of the, the co-creators of, of Python and HTML and um, other computer languages, Stephen's now working on a new way of um, thinking the algorithm that works from procedural thinking to declarative thinking. And that may seem like a completely abstract differentiation, but I'm sure that by the end of the talk, you'll be able to understand the significance of the two different kinds of thinking. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. <laughs> so 2017 is an important milestone year because it's uh, 60 years after this event, which was the first time a city council uh, uh, ever installed a computer. It was in Britain. It wasn't London or Westminster or Manchester or Birmingham. No, it was Norwich. Um, so here they are unloading uh, just one of 21 cabinets, uh, which was to become the, uh, the, that, that computer produced by the firm of El called Elliot. Now, two years ago uh, was also uh, a milestone year because of this. Now, you can't see from there what it is, but this is the uh, uh, Raspberry Pi Zero. Uh, uh, and uh, here's the same computer at the same location. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Raspberry Pi Zero is uh, so important because it was the first computer, uh, general purpose computer, that was so cheap that they gave it away free on the cover of a magazine. Uh, so uh, I'd just like to get a feeling for you for, uh, for how do you think those two computers compared. So, so, it, uh, so the, the, is the Elliot the more powerful computer? Is the Raspberry Pi computer uh, more uh, powerful or, or are they uh, approximately the same? So can I just see a show of hands of people who think that the Elliot was the more powerful computer? Uh, anybody think that they were about the same? So that means the rest of you think that uh, the Raspberry Pi was more powerful? Yeah? So how more powerful do you think the Raspberry Pi was? Can I see a show of hands? Ten times more powerful? Anybody think that it's a hundred times more powerful? Yeah, well, actually, it's, uh, uh, it's actually a million times faster. <laughs> Which means that if they had run the, uh, uh, the Elliott computer 24 hours a day for 10 years nonstop, uh, they would have done the amount of computing that you can do on a Raspberry Pi Zero in five minutes. In fact, it's slightly less than five minutes. Now, if we compare those two, two computers, uh, the Elliott at that time cost £85,000, but uh, that was in, in 1957, of, of course. If you convert that to modern money, well, it depends exactly what you compare it with, but it's between £2 million and £7 million uh, uh, currently. Now, the Pi Zero costs uh, £4, uh, so that's an improvement in a, of, a, of around a million, let's say. Uh, you should bear in mind that the median take-home wage then for men was 250 pounds and for women 125 pounds. And now it's uh, around 30,000 pounds for men and 25,000 pounds for, for women. So uh, wages have only improved about a factor of uh, 100 to 200. If we compare the speed, well, I already said it was about a million times, it's about a million times faster. If we compare the memory, uh, you only had a kilobyte of memory on that, uh, that Elliott computer. You now have half a megabyte on the, uh, on the Raspberry Pi Zero, so that's an improvement of a half million times. 
The size is an improvement of about nearly two and a half times. Uh, the slides are all online, so you don't have to write these details down. You can, uh, you can get them online later. Uh, if you compare the weight, well, the Elliot weighed uh, between three and six tons, uh, uh, and the Pi Zero weighs nine grams. So that's a, a half million times improvement. So <coughs> the Raspberry Pi is a million times faster and a million times cheaper, a millionth of the price. So in other words, a factor of a million million, which uh, uh, Europeans call a billion, but uh, Anglo-Saxons call a trillion. So uh, another example of a million million is, is a terabyte, and, and, and uh, that's actually a very big number. And it's interesting to find out whether re people really know how big a number it is. So, so, if I, uh, so if I asked you to take your terabyte disk and to count every single byte on it, and I'm allowing you to have holidays and, and you know weekends and only eight hours a day counting. Uh, so let's say over a year you can, or over a day, uh, you can average counting one byte at a time. So how long do you think uh, that it would take you to count all the bytes on a terabyte disk? So who thinks it would take longer than a year? Anybody think it would take l uh, longer than 10 years? Yeah, longer than a century? In fact, it would take you 30,000 years. <laughs> a terabyte is an enormous number, and that's the level of an improvement that we've got had in computing since 1957. Uh, funnily enough, a million million t times improvement is approximately what you'd expect from if Moore's law had, had, uh, had been valid from 1957, except that the, pi, ras the Raspberry Pi Zero is two million times smaller uh, so, in fact, it's done even better than that. It's just an immense improvement, even over what we might have expected from Moore's law. So, that's how we get, we've got the, we're getting the Internet of Things now. We've got these thousands of cheap, tiny devices with low processing power, but, I mean, low only in terms of modern, uh, modern uh, 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 computing, uh, uh, and, and they're producing uh, various data formats uh, they're doing it in text or XML or JSON. Uh, they're all different ways of, uh, of accessing the data on those things, uh, either going to the device itself or the device sending it to you and you'd better be listening when it comes in, or sending it to the cloud and you having to go to some other machine somewhere else. So that, that means turning the data from all these devices is a real fiddly job. It means you've got a program and it means you've got to deal with all these different ways of accessing data and ways of reading the data and interpreting the data. <coughs> I should say that the Internet of Things is not actually new. The, 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 the 20 years ago, a typical uh, petrol station would have embedded devices in all the pumps, uh, in the storage tanks, in the tills, in the vending machines. And these were all cent centrally accessible uh, uh, and readable uh, for, for control. What is new is the ubiquity that they're everywhere, the diversity of the devices that you don't have much control over, the flexibility of things that you can do with them, and, of course, the price. Now, uh, not many people know this, but the P in IoT stands for privacy, uh, and uh, the S stands for security. And you say, there isn't any P in IoT, and I say, exactly. For instance, you may, have, you may have heard of the recent case uh, a couple of weeks ago of a casino being hacked because they got into the fish tank. There was a computer controlling the, uh, the, the, the environment of the fish tank. That was where the security leak was. Once they were inside the firewall, as it were, once they were inside the casino, casino then they could go from there to the real computers in the casino. Or another example is of a car being hacked via its radio. So they broke into the radio, and that meant they got control from there of the whole car, including the motor, the, the accelerating, the lights, the radio, everything. They could switch it off and on. And if you read that story, there's a link there. It's very frightening, because this guy, they, promised, they showed this guy how it's done, the journalist, and he's driving along the motorway, and suddenly the motor cuts out, and he has no control over his car anymore. Very scary. So IoT is actually introducing lots of pro problems uh, uh, for everybody. Firstly, ownership. Uh, who owns the data? Because if your data is being sent off to Google, are you the owner of it or is Google the owner of it? Um, privacy. Uh, who can see it and, 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 uh, and, and who could do stuff with it? And the security. Who's allowed to do anything with, all, with that data? Uh, uh, is it yours? Are you the only one who's got control over it? 
So these are some of the problems that we're trying to address with the, uh, the, the project that, that I and, uh, and Jack after me are, go are going to uh, describe, uh, that we want to try and solve some of these problems so that when we're building these, these systems that Pablo described, that they're, they're connecting and we've got, we've got a unified way of dealing with these things so that life becomes much easier for us. So what we want to do is retain the data. The data is ours. If we want to give it to somebody else, we can, but we get to decide that. So control who can see and modify the data on the devices. We don't want to bother about the differences in formats that the different devices are sending. We just want it to be treated as if they're all the same. We want to integrate that then into a homogeneous, homogeneous collection so that we can then combine the data in different ways and use it in different ways. And then we want to be able to update the data and the devices automatically as necessary. <coughs> without having to do too much uh, 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 manual, uh, manual control. So the RESTful uh, was, uh, was more a play of words than anything. So REST is, is the underlying uh, uh, architectural basis of the World Wide Web, uh, which we as, as a group have been involved with right from the beginning. In 1994, uh, I organized workshops at the first web conference at CERN, uh, and uh, a number of us in the group have, have been involved with designing the technologies of the web, HTML, CSS, Smile, uh, a whole bunch of them that, that we've, uh, that we've uh, helped design. The nice thing about REST is that, well, it's, 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 it's scalable, um, but uh, it, we also have proof that it uh, can save a, a, a lot of work, effort, and, and money in producing applications uh, if you do it right. So our system uses a REST-style declarative in interface, and I'll explain that word in a moment, uh, to access and control the devices uh, so that we don't have to worry about the differences between them all. So <coughs> Claire mentions this difference between declarative and procedural. Uh, and I just want to briefly say what, what that is. So procedural, actually, I'll, so I'll do it the other way around. Procedural is how programming is now done, uh, uh, typically. And that describes how to reach a solution. So for instance, it, it's similar to how... how uh, uh, cooking recipes are, that it tells you step for step how to get the solution. Whereas declarative approaches describes the solution space and allows the computer then to work towards a solution. So let me give you just a very small example of the first time you will have ever heard a, a declarative uh, um, a definition. At school, <coughs> you learn to add and to multiply and to divide, and you learn how to do that procedurally, the steps that you have to go through to get to an answer. But there comes a moment at school when you get this definition of a square root. It's the number that when you multiply it by itself, it gives you the original number. Now that's declarative because it describes the solution space so that if you see a, a square root and somebody says this is the square root of that number, you can check it. Uh, it helps you understand what it is, but there's no information here on about, about how to, how to uh, uh, calculate a square root. And that often doesn't matter because nowadays we've got machines that will do that for us. Now, if I showed you the procedural uh, uh, definition of how to do a square root, it looks like this. And this is a very simplified version. There's actually much more detail that I've left out. But if you look at this bit of programming, uh, if I hadn't told you that it was for square roots, it's unlikely that you would have known that, uh, that that's what it uh, did. Uh, and you would have to run this several times on different numbers, and you might then begin to get an inkling, oh, it's, it's calculating square roots. But by looking at this, there's no indication that it's about square roots. And that's a big difference between declarative and procedural. Declarative is very much more around the solution space that it, it describes what it is. And procedural is, tells you how to get there, but it's very difficult to see how the two are linked. We, therefore, are very much trying to do all our work uh, at least at the exterior level, uh, using declarative uh, 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 processes. And, I'm, and I'll show you some of that in a moment. So the architecture that we're building <coughs> is a data repository, or uh, actually more, d several d data repos repositories. A layer over the system that hides the data format uh, and access differences so that Within the system, the data is just coming in, and the system doesn't has, have to worry about where it's coming from, what format it's in, and so on. Uh, and then we specify in a declarative way the, the constraints on and the relationships between these values. 
and then different events can then change, change those values. And so this, is, this sounds all rather abstract, but I'll give you some, some, some real-life examples sh shortly. So if you know the term XML, that's what you're using. If you don't, don't worry about it. It's, it's a, a technical detail, but uh, that's, that's, how we're, that's the format of the data that, we, that, that we're using to store the data in. The repository of data is kept up to date with all the devices automatically, so, so that they send their data in and the device just updates the, uh, updates the data without anybody having to do anything. And if the data changes, that data gets sent back to the devices, again, without, uh, without any intervention. So it's bi-directional bi uh, communication with the devices. Um, so, here's, uh, so, so an example of this is that if the lights are connected to our system, then there's just a, a value that says whether the lights are on or not, zero or one. So if the lights are on in the data, the, the, that, that data is a one, and if they're off, it's a zero. But the nice thing is, if we then change that zero into one, the lights go on. And if we change the one to a zero, the lights go off. Um, so uh, the, the repository co communicates autonomously with the devices. Uh, and we can make them plugins if we've got a new device, then we only have to make a little bit of software to plug into the system to communicate with a new device which knows about the format of the data and how to communicate it with, uh, uh, communicate with it and then stores the data in our repository. Um, yeah, that's what was it. Uh, uh, and, and I should say that we don't just have one version of our repository, but we, ha we have several over different places, and they all communicate uh, uh, with each other. The last element of the architecture are events. So things can happen that change the data, and the system learns of that event and can respond to it in some way. So for instance, if you change that zero to a one for the lights, then the system knows, oh, that means that that data is, is connected to that plugin which switches the lights on. I won't say the rest of that. Uh, and, and the relationships between data, and that, that's what I'm now going to show in examples, so that <coughs> you, can, you can say, well, these things are related so that if one of them changes, something else has got to change with it. So these are necessarily simple examples, but they give you a taste of how the system works and what it's about. So I've already told you about this simple single value, lights. When the value is 1, the lights are on, and when the value is 0, the lights are off. And it's a two-way relationship, as I said, so that if you set the value to zero, the lights go off. Uh, and it doesn't ha just have to be you. It can, it can be any process. If it sets it to one, the lights go on. Now, there's another value. Is Jack at home? And this is not two-way. That's a joke. <laughs> that is to say, if I set it to zero, it doesn't throw him out of the front door. Um, but what we can say... There are two, now, there are two ways that we can... Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, Jack. <laughs> there are two ways you can impl inf uh, influence a value in the data store. And, and the first one is just pure equality, which sh says that the, the relationship with to the f between these two values is always true. So if I say that lights equals Jack home, that means that if Jack is at home, the lights are on. And if Jack's not at home, the lights are off. Well, that's not very handy because sometimes he likes to sleep and he likes to sleep when it, with it dark, so that's, that's not an interesting way of doing it. But luckily, there's another way of specifying a relationship, which is this arrow. And this only changes the, the value when the value of the expression changes. So in this case, if we say lights becomes Jack's ho Jack, ho Jack home, this means that lights come on when he arrives home, or they are on when he arrives home, but they may have been on already. And it ensures that they go off when he leaves, uh, but they might have been off already if he'd switched them on. Since this only happens at events when the values change, it means you can have an override. So for instance, you can have a switch on the wall, which also has a value in our database, so that when you switch it on, it switches the, uh, <coughs> the changes the value in the, in the repository to a one, and if you switch it off, the, the value goes back to a zero. And so we can say, well, the lights are also listening to these events, so that if I change the switch, uh, the lights go off, and I change the switch, so that the switch, the lights go on again. And these two things are in independent, so I can change the lights to off, but then Jack walks in and the lights go on again. 
An interesting thing about this is, of course, that no longer are switches on the wall high, hard wired to the lights. You can decide what you want to do with that switch. So if that switch is to switch the music on and off, that's, that's up to you. You just, you just uh, write one of these declarative uh, definitions. Uh, I should just say that, that there isn't a th actually a thing called uh, uh, Jack Home. Uh, that's just, in this terms of this talk, it's just a, a shorthand for, for a, a longer uh, uh, expression uh, to get that value from the, from the database. Now, of course, you don't want the lights to come on when, it, uh, when, when it's already, if it's light outside, if, the, if, if it's daytime. Um, but you, you can make a, a sensor that detects whether it's dark or light. And that also has a value in the data store uh, of 0 or 1. Is it light or is it dark? So what we can do is we can say, uh, the lights go on if Jack is home and it's dark. So this simple statement now is a way of programming your lights that switches the lights on if Jack comes home in the dark. It switches them on if he's already home and it gets dark. It switches the lights off when Jack leaves, uh, whether or not they were already on. And it ensures the lights are off uh, when it gets light. So this simple statement does all that programming for you. Uh, you could combine them with an e equality. Uh, so you if you said this, this would work in exactly the same way. But the advantage of doing it the other way is that you can more easily change the, 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 the use of the switch, for instance, without destroying how, how the other statements work. So it's, it's, it's quite modular if you separate them off into different, different statements. Now, how do we know if Jack's home, though, on the other hand? Well, uh, there are a number of sensors around the house. Uh, for instance, he's got, uh, he's got his phone, uh, which connects to the Wi-Fi. He's got a laptop that uh, connects to the Wi-Fi, and he's got a watch that's got Bluetooth in it. So there are lots of things that we could use to sense Jack in his, in his home. The problem is that we can't just say, well, he's at home if we see his phone and his, and his watch and his laptop, because... Sometimes he switches his laptop off. It doesn't happen very often, but uh, sometimes he does. So we could say, well, uh, it's when we see his phone or his watch or his laptop. But that doesn't necessarily work either because he might leave his, his watch or his phone at home. So what we do is a sort of heuristic, and we just count the number of things we can see. And if we see more than one, then we just assume that Jack is home. Of course, it, Jack doesn't live alone, so, so the, it would be a pretty annoying if everybody's at home and suddenly the lights go out because J Jack's gone off to work. So, uh, so we actually create a value that combines the three values. Is Jack home, is Jill home, or is Jim home? Uh, these are not real people, by the way. <laughs> uh, so, so now that we've got, got this information about whether there's anybody in the house, we can say, for instance, well, the, the heating is on is activated only when somebody is at home. And here we really can use an equality, and it just means that if everybody leaves the house, automatically the heating gets switched off. And if anybody comes home, it gets switched back on again. So, of course, the Internet of Things is great, but the problem, problem is that it connects to all this infrastructure, the Wi-Fi, the electricity, uh, and, and the Wi-Fi connects to the internet, and the internet connects to the DNS system, and so on and so on. And we don't want you coming home and standing in front of your front door and not being able to get in because the internet is down, let's say. So uh, we've got lots of version, lots of, 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 of copies of our system, which we call Igor, by the way. Um, we've got lots of them, and, and, and they're just around devices. So each device will have a small version of Igor, which are then connected to, to, to other versions. So, of course, if there's a power cut, then you really are screwed. But, but uh, <laughs> apart, apart from that, uh, we don't want to depend on any of the infrastructure so that you can still at least get into your house. Uh, so we don't depend on a central version. This system is really distributed. Um, yeah, so I've said all that. So, of course, pr privacy is, a, is, is an important issue, uh, uh, and, and we, we, want to, we want to make sure that nobody can see uh, the data except the people or the devices that need to see the, see the, see the, uh, uh, the data. So we're, this is not yet implemented, but we're, it's something we're working on now. What we want to be able to do is that for Jack to be able to tell somebody, that, says he, that let somebody look to see if he's at home, for instance, uh, uh, the janitor in the house might want to know uh, if, uh, if uh, Jack is home or if somebody's home. 
but the fact that the system knows his home because of his telephone MAC address, the system doesn't reveal that data to the person who knows that he's home. All it, all it reveals is just the single piece of information, is Jack home or not? And it means then that, that, that he can't walk past the pub down the road and say, oh, I see that Jack is here, because he doesn't know any more details other than Jack is home or not. Oh, I did that wrong. So this is, uh, again, a bit technical, but uh, the architecture is primarily state-based. That means it's just data that's changing. And as the da cha data changes, then it autonomously affects the devices. Now, that's quite a different way to how IoT uh, systems are, are, are done now. In particular, uh, they're based on event often based on just events. And uh, if, if this, then that is, is an example of a system that deals with that. And the nice thing about our state-based system is that it makes the fine-grained control of, uh, of privacy much easier because we've got, we've got a sort of structure of data and we can say at any level in that data whether you're allowed to look at that or, or, or not. Um, with a, a, an event system, it's much difficult because basically every time uh, you get an event, you have to know what the privacy details are. But in our system, the state holds the privacy details, and so it, it always knows what the, what, the, what the privacy details are. Um, so, as I said, we're still, we're still researching uh, uh, the, what we're doing for privacy. Uh, we've got an, a master's student uh, doing the research uh, uh, with us, um, but uh, we believe that, uh, that each person who looks at the system can have a token which then can, can be, the, be, kept, be compared with the privacy settings and determine whether that person is allowed <coughs> to look at that bit of data or not. I'm nearly, it's nearly at the end now, so of course we need a user interface for all this, um, but the nice thing is that the data is, all, is the whole system. It just res reflects the whole system. You don't need to know anything more than the look at the data and possibly change it. Luckily, we have uh, the, uh, a language, uh, Xforms, which more or less reflects exactly the structure that the system has, namely uh, a collection of data, events, and constraints, which allows us very easily to look at the data, to change it, and affect a change just by changing the data. Uh, the link takes you to uh, um, a talk that I gave that explains that in, in more detail. So, in conclusion, we're at very early stages. We do have a, a system up and running. We're using it. Uh, it insulates us from the details, just as, just as I promised. Uh, it runs on Raspberry Pis at the moment. Uh, not, not the zero, but the three, um, or the two. Oh, it does run on the zero now. OK, good news. Uh, it gives us, as I hope you've seen, a very simple but powerful me mechanism for reading and controlling devices. Uh, we have uh, uh, systems running now 24-7 at three locations, I think I'm right in saying. Uh, but uh, if you want to see the software and if you know how to deal with it, uh, then you can get it from there and you're welcome to play with it. Thank you. <laughs>